Chapter 1. The Nature of the American System Periodically, there are protests over the use of the name America as a synonym for the United States and American as the name of United States citizens. There's a measure of justice in this, in that the peoples of the North, South and Central Americas are equally American, but as understood by countless millions the world over and by generations of immigrants, America means the United States and America is the New World. The other countries are seen as derivative in culture and tradition, Spanish, British, Portuguese or French, but America represents a fresh departure in history. Not only foreigners and immigrants, but also Americans themselves have so read their history. This was, as Abraham Lincoln stated it in his Gettysburg Address, a new nation, a new proposition in history. George Washington, in his farewell address, saw that new nation as not only one with deep roots in the past, but one with an obligation to separate itself from dead Europe as well. Quote, our own end quote was to him something more than an eight-year history, and Europe spelled to him a cycle of frustration. Therefore, quote, why quit our own to stand upon foreign ground? Why be interweaving our destiny with that of any part of Europe, endanger our peace and prosperity in the toils of European ambition, rivalship, interest, humour or caprice? End quote. Quote, unquote, our destiny was a very real thing to Washington, and it did not mean a return to Europe's present evil. Thomas Jefferson stated it very bluntly, quote, We are maniacs if we try to make Europe moral or to settle their disputes by war. End quote. Coupled with this sense of newness and destiny was a sense of restoration. The, quote, ancient rights of freeborn Englishmen, end quote, and the, quote, liberties of the Christian church, end quote, were the central aspects of the American restoration. To understand the nature of the American system, it's necessary to understand what it was that the colonists and constitutionalists were bent on restoring and furthering, and what the main causes of the American Revolution were. It should be noted in passing that the American Revolution was not a revolution in the modern sense of that word. After the French Revolution, that word gained a new connotation, one by no means applicable to the American event. Two causes stand out clearly as basic to the break between the colonies and George III. The third cause was the religious issue. John Adams cited the attempt of Parliament to force the establishment of the Church of England on the colonies as responsible, quote, as much as any other cause, end quote, for the break. Quote, the objection was not merely to the office of a bishop, though even that was dreaded, but to the authority of Parliament on which it must be founded, end quote. We can agree with Breidenbaugh that, quote, It is indeed high time that we repossess the important historical truth that religion was a fundamental cause of the American Revolution, end quote. Every colony had its own form of Christian establishment or settlement. Every one was a particular kind of Christian republic, it was to them a monstrous idea, to Anglicans as well as to Congregationalists and Presbyterians, for an alien body, Parliament, to impose an establishment upon them. The colonies were by nature and history Christian. Not only the religious settlements of New England and the central states, but the southern colonies as well had their specifically Christian purpose and character. The word, quote-unquote, plantation in those days whether applied to a New England or a Southern settlement, had reference to a religious establishment of peoples. The concept of a secular state was virtually non-existent in 1776, as well as in 1787, when the Constitution was adopted, and no less so when the Bill of Rights was adopted. To read the Constitution as the character for a secular state is to misread history and to misread it radically. The Constitution was designed to perpetuate a Christian order. Let us consider the obvious rebuttal to such a statement, for it needs to be met. Why then is there, in the main, an absence of any reference to Christianity in the Constitution? The response must be equally blunt. There is an absence of reference because the framers of the Constitution did not believe that this was an area of jurisdiction for the federal government. 
it would not have occurred to them to attempt to re-establish that which the colonists had fought against, namely religious control and establishment by the central government. The colonists would not have tolerated power in the Federal Union which they rebelled against when claimed by Crown and Parliament. Every constituent state had some form of Christian establishment or settlement which it jealously guarded. This was an area of states' rights, not of federal control. The Constitution, through its doctrine of express powers, had barred the federal governments from any jurisdiction over the churches by omission of reference to them in the grants of powers. Nonetheless, many clergymen as well as others were fearful and demanded a Bill of Rights and a specific exclusion of the federal government from the realm of religion. The First Amendment answered this demand. Congress shall make no laws respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. It should be noted, first, that nothing is here said about the separation of church and state. No such separation of Christianity or church and the state existed anywhere in the United States before or for some generations after the ratification of this amendment. Second, the federal government did not secularize itself. Congress, both before and after ratification, began its sessions with divine worship and felt no inhibition in exercising its faith. Moreover, by reenacting the Northwest Ordinance of July 13, 1787, after the adoption of the First Amendment, the federal government continued the policy of Article 3 of that ordinance, quote, Religion, morality and knowledge, being necessary to good governments and the happiness of mankind, schools and the means of education shall forever be encouraged, end quote. To ensure the Christian order of the potential states, the territories were to be helped in this respect. Third, the rights of the constituent states to maintain their Christian order without interference was underscored by barring Congress, that is, the federal government, from either establishing or prohibiting religion. What the thirteen Christian republics had fought to uphold against Crown and Parliament, they refused to surrender to a federal government. The freedom of the First Amendment from federal interference is not from religion, but for religion in the constituent states. The establishments and settlements in the constituent states were definitely and specifically Christian. In most states, single or plural establishment prevailed. Where no church was established, Christianity as such was nonetheless firmly entrenched. There were religious requirements for citizenship and suffrage, religious oaths, laws prohibiting blasphemy, laws requiring a Trinitarian faith or a firm belief in the infallibility of Scripture, and laws barring unbelievers as witnesses in court. Court decisions sometimes cited biblical law when civil law did not entirely fit the case. In many areas, laws against unbelief were in the statute books. A man could be imprisoned for atheism. Warren Chase complained of it as an example of slavery and barbarism that in the 1820s, quote, An old man was imprisoned 60 days in Boston for publishing in his own paper the fact that he didn't believe in their orthodox God, end quote. The laws were premised on the fact that the respective states were Christian and anti-Christianity constituted treasonable activity or belief. The basis of the state being Christian that foundation had to be protected legally. Although the US Supreme Court is currently striking at some of these laws, many still remain in the books. The claim of the US Supreme Court to jurisdiction in these affairs is a violation of the First Amendment and has no real warrant in the Fourteenth Amendment. By claiming the rights to intervene to disestablish the U.S. Supreme Court has also implicitly established the power denied to it by the Constitution to prohibit religion. And if the current move in the courts to compel taxation of the churches succeeds, it will place religion under state regulation. The states, it has been noted, had their independent existence as Christian republics prior to the revolution. They retained their prerogative here without diminution, sharing none of it with the federal government. 
They did, however, in varying degrees, share that prerogative with their constituent units, the counties. The counties very often adapted the law to their specific requirements. The reason for this was an obvious one. America represented a series of settlements by religious and ethnic groups so that each area had and has its specific religious and ethnic orientation. According to a study of the current scene published in 1962, quote, In approximately one half of the counties of a nation, a single religious body accounts for at least 50% of all the membership in the county. End quote. The likelihood is that this is even more true of ethnic orientation, that is, that most counties are dominated by a particular ethnic group. As one travels across the United States, the pluralistic character is readily apparent. One area will be Swedish and Lutheran, Mission Covenant and Evangelical Free Church. Another county will be German and Roman Catholic and Reformed, another Dutch and Reformed Church and Christian Reformed, English and Episcopalian, Scots-Irish and Presbyterian and so on. As a result, until recently, it wasn't uncommon to find nuns teaching at schools in one area and the local Lutheran pastor dominant in his influence over the school in another area. In some areas, American-born Germans speak English with an accent, and in other areas, similar examples of the dominance of a local culture are apparent. America was colonised by various groups who congregated in sections of cities and specific rural areas out of choice. This fact reinforced the basic localism of the American civil structure. The second cause of the American Revolution was again a defence against invasion, an invasion of colonial self-government by parliament. The revolution was actually a defensive war waged by the colonists against parliamentary troops. To understand the significance of that invasion, it's necessary to recognise that the American civil structure was, almost from its inception, a Protestant restoration of feudalism. To the colonists, as to the barons who wrestled Magna Carta from King John, English liberty meant feudalism in essence, localism as against centralism, contractual government as against absolutism. Almost at once the colonies gravitated to localism and contractualism. Their charters with the English crown were feudal contracts, and there was no relationship between colonies and crown except in terms of these charters. Although the crown was often arbitrary and sought to be absolutistic, the legal basis remained feudal. Each colony was thus an independent state with its own independent civil structure under a feudal lord, represented in the colony by the royal governor. In the colonies, this Protestant feudal restoration was steadily developed, even as absolutism was steadily developed in England. At first, the Crown claimed divine rights, and then, in 1688, Parliament claimed the right to exercise royal absolutism in the name of the King. In contrast, in the colonies, and at times with astonishing rapidity, power gravitated from the state, that is, the colony, to the local level. A large degree of autonomy was accorded to each town in Massachusetts as early as the General Court of 1635 because of the steady insistence on local self-government. Local officials became locally elected. In the declining days of feudalism in England, Robin Hood's enemy had been the sheriff and the county officials, all crown appointees. Against these, his feudal rebellion was directed. Now, in Americans' feudal restoration, these officers were steadily made the county's men. Any attempt, as of that in Massachusetts in relation to the Bay of Judges, to centralise authority over the colonies in London, was bitterly resisted as an invasion of liberty. Parliament, however, was bent on extending its power into the colonies, and the Crown was agreeable to this encroachment. Parliament, nonetheless, had no legal jurisdiction, and its legislation, as well as the quartering of troops, constituted an invasion of the colonies. We can understand the situation better by a rough but still valid analogy. If today Parliament were to assume the right to dissolve Canadian civil governments, to appoint officers, to legislate for Canada, and to quarter troops there in case of resistance, 
it would constitute an invasion of a state which, beyond a common monarch and certain ties of empire and commonwealth, is a free and independent state. The thirteen colonies were free and independent states under their feudal lord, George III. They were not under parliaments, but had their own legislative bodies and internally independent structures. The colonies had the right and power to issue their own money, a right which Parliament sought to destroy. As early as 1606, in the first charter of Virginia, it was declared, quote, And they shall, or lawfully may, establish and cause to be made a coin to pass current there between the peoples of these several colonies, for the more ease of traffic and bargaining between and amongst them and the nations there, of such metal, and in such manner and form, as the several councils there shall limit and appoint. End quote. A state empowered to control and coin its own money is an independent state. The Crown didn't reserve even to itself the right to coin money, but saw that as a function of the local self-governments. The actions of parliaments here and in other issues constituted an invasion of the colonies, and the actions of George III a violation of his feudal responsibilities. The Declaration of Independence accordingly never mentioned the British Parliament. They had no legal relationship thereto, and had no need to declare themselves independent of an authority to which they had never been subject. There are two veiled references to this fact. Quote, he, the king, has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving us assent to their pretended acts of legislation. End quote. The other reference to Parliament is this. Quote, we have warned them, our English brethren, of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. End quote. The Declaration did cite the royal acts which rendered the king's feudal lordship over the colonies null and void. Not the colonies, but the king had rebelled against the prevailing law and order. Legality was thus on the side of the colonists. As the Declaration stated it, quote, The history of the present king of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. End quote. And this was an accurate statement. Parliamentary claims to absolute power were the issue, and royal assent thereto. The legal meat of the Declaration is not in its opening generalities, but in its specific demonstration that a legal, contractual and feudal relationship with George III had been violated and set aside by him, and the colonies invaded. They were not in rebellion against the idea of a ruler, but against, quote, a tyrant unfit to be the ruler of a free people. End quote. Here again, having rebelled against centralism and absolutism, the states were not about to give any federal government the powers that they would not tolerate in the hands of their mother country. Indeed, they had been more indulgent of the mother country than they were now ready to be of the federal government. The purpose of the Constitution was thus not to create a strong central government but rather to create a federal union that had just enough strength to maintain their unity and to limit that government severely in order to prevent any future rise of centralism. The Constitution accordingly makes 80 grants of power to the federal government while levying 115 prohibitions against it. To the federal legislative authority, there are 20 grants of power and 70 restraints. In addition, the Express Powers Doctrine Implicit in the Constitution is firmly spelled out in Amendments 9 and 10 as a further check on the federal government. In Amendment 11, the states asserted their further independence of federal jurisdiction. But it would be a serious error to assert that the alternative to federal sovereignty is states' rights. Important as the states are, they are not the basic unit of the American system. The basic unit is clearly and without question the county. Significantly, one of the first steps towards independence was taken by Mecklenburg County, North Carolina, on May 31, 1775, in order to prevent a legal vacuum. We've already noted that the county had certain powers with reference to religion. More important in other areas, the county had full jurisdiction, and these areas constitute the essence of civil government. 
First, the property tax remained in the hands of the county which had early established its jurisdiction. The people of an area thus controlled their tax assessor and their county supervisors so that the taxing power was not beyond their jurisdiction. When the power to tax leaves the county, tyranny will then begin in the United States. Socialism or communism will be only a step away. The people of a county will be helpless as their property is taxed to the point of expropriation by a distant state capital. A step in this direction is already being contemplated in California. As yet, however, this all-important power remains for the most part with the county. One of the central reasons for the Constitution was the failure of the Confederation because of its inability to tax, its Congress being dependent on the grants of the several states. While certain powers granted by the Articles of Confederation were subsequently removed by the Constitution, the central extension of power was a power to tax. This was circumscribed in two ways. First, debt paper money was barred, Congress and the states being limited to hard money and Congress being limited to coining money, regulating its value and fixing the standard of weights and measures. Article 1, Section 8. This power was specifically restricted to Congress, not to a central bank. Since debt, paper money and inflation are forms of taxation, this was a severe limitation upon the powers of Congress, which had previously issued debt, paper money, as had the states. Second, quote, no capitation or other direct tax, end quote, on the citizens could be levied, quote, unless in proportion to the census or enumeration herein before directed to be taken, end quote, end quote. No tax or duty on articles exported from any state, end quote, was permitted, Article 1, Section 9. Taxes were essentially, quote, duties, imposts and excises, end quote, whose purpose was to, quote, to pay the debts and provide for the common defence and general welfare of the United States, end quote, Article 1, Section 8. Quote, general warfare, end quote, was clearly not intended to mean aid to individuals, and Madison so stated it in The Federalist. Thus, the most important area of taxation, property, was left to the county, and income itself was regarded by the Supreme Court as outside federal authority prior to the passage of the 16th Amendment. In spite of the income tax, the basic power to tax still remains on the county level. Second, criminal law was and is county law in essence. This was an important safeguard against tyranny and against the political use of criminal law. Law enforcement officers, including judges, were and are officers of the county in the main or of its constituent units. As T. Robert Ingram has pointed out, not too many years ago, executions were also held at the county seat. Police power and criminal law are thus matters of local jurisdiction in the American system. This makes possible, on the moral decline of the community, a slack enforcement of law and order, but, more than that, it is the basic ingredient of liberty in the American legal system, of self-government in both church and state. It is local authority, it is self-government. It means truly that which the jury system requires, trial by one's peers. Third, civil law is also county law to a great degree, enforced by local courts and by locally elected officials. The American citizen is thus, for the most part, under county government rather than state and federal government. His basic instruments of civil government are local, residing in the county, and the county is his historic line of defence against the encroachment of state and federal governments. In early America, town and county elections were properly regarded as more important than state and federal elections, and property qualifications were more strict on the local level. The county was the heart of the Protestant feudal restoration, and the growth of states, and especially federal power, was as much distrusted as the growth of royal power, and royal absolutism had been hated and distrusted in an earlier era. The county is currently under assault from the United Nations, federal, state and metropolitan planners. 
City and county manager plans have been and continue to be instrumental in subverting representative government and in undermining localism. Even as feudalism was and still is identified with backwardness and primitiveness, so the historic American system is now slandered as belonging to a horse and buggy age. The first major assault on localism came very early, and it came from the States. The Constitution, in establishing the Electoral College, made it the exact numerical counterpart of Congress, with one elector for each congressional district and two at large for the two senators. The Constitutional Convention did not presume to order the states strictly to follow the congressional districts with an elector named from each district, but it certainly suggested this by the exact coincidence of structure. It was assumed in the proceedings of the convention that prominent and able men from each congressional district and from the state at large would be elected or appointed as electors and, to retain their independence and integrity, the electors could not be a senator or representative or person holding an office of trust or profit under the United States. Article 11, Section 1 for some years, a variety of methods were used and electors often had a measure of independence as well as ties to the local district. In 1836, however, the general ticket was used in every state except South Carolina, where election by the legislature continued until 1860, and rarely since then has there been a departure from the general ticket. State politicians had come to recognise the power inherent in the general ticket, Instead of binding each elector to the vote of the congressional district, with only the two at large bound to the state vote, the general ticket took the power from the congressional district, the local unit, and gave it to the state. As a result, while every congressional district in a state except those of the large urban centre may vote for one candidate, their votes are nullified by the slim majority given by the urban vote, and all electoral votes can go to the other candidate. The state politicians were not alone in recognising the power inherent in the general ticket. Minority groups quickly recognised that it gave them the balance of power between the two parties. The first group to make use of this power was the abolitionist movement. Slavery had previously been a source of tension, but had been very far from dominating federal politics. Now the picture changed rapidly. A few thousand abolitionists, for example, in New York State could, by throwing their vote to one party or another, decide the outcome of an election. In New York State, for over 30 years after 1792, the legislature chose the electors, the excuse for the legal provision thereof in 1792 being that, quote, there was not sufficient time prior to the election of 1792 to make arrangements for a popular choice of electors, end quote. In 1824, when the demand for popular election mounted, there were 260,000 voters and 160 state legislators in New York. Governor Yates expected an amendment to the US Constitution to correct the situation and require district election. After much struggle, popular pressure led to a change to the election of electors by districts as against 1. Election by legislature 2. Election on a general ticket with a plurality vote, or 3. Election on a general ticket with a majority vote. New York went on the general ticket system in the election of 1832. On the general ticket plan, only a few thousand votes were needed to swing the state for a particular candidate, hence the bargaining power of the minority groups. The New York votes from 1824 to 1836 is instructive in this regard. In the 1824 presidential election, the New York electoral vote was as follows. With the legislature choosing the electors, Jackson 1, Adams 26, Crawford 5, Clay 4. In 1828, with districts electing the governors, the results were as follows. Jackson, 140,763 votes, 50.97% of the vote, 20 electors. Adams, 135,413 votes, 49.03% of the vote, 16 electors. 
In 1832, with the general ticket system, Jackson received 168,562 votes, or 52.11%, and 42 electoral votes. While Clay, who received 154,986 votes, or 47.89%, received no electoral votes. In 1836, Van Buren also took all 42 electoral votes, with 166,886 popular votes, or 54.6%, while Harrison, with 138,765 votes, or 45.4%, received no electoral votes. The significance of this fact that a block vote of a few thousand could dictate to either party or any candidate certain terms in return for their vote was not lost on politicians or on minority groups. Control had passed out of the hands of the reasonable majorities on either side into the hands of the unbending, single-issue minorities. In many areas, these groups early to control. The effect on national politics was devastating. The slavery issue was forced upon both parties and upon Congress by the ability of the minority to control the outcome in state elections. The effect upon the parties was also shattering. The national democracy increasingly became a southern party. The Whigs were broken because of their temporising on the issue. And the Republican Party was born, a party which in 1860 elected a minority president, Lincoln, and which was itself dominated not by its majority, but by a minority. The Civil War was thus a product of the rise to power of a minority through the general ticket. Since then, the minority power has been consistently used as the chief instrument of power. Various groups were effective from the Civil War to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, but since Roosevelt, this instrument has been especially refined. Minority groups, by means of the general ticket, hold the balance of power in many states. The Labour vote, Negros, Catholics, Zionist Jews, pensioners and the like. Candidates campaign accordingly, not for the vote of the majority of Republicans and Democrats, but for the swing vote, the minority and single-issue voter who now governs American politics. Only by restoring localism, by amending the Constitution to require the coincidence of the Electoral College and its vote with the structure of Congress, can minority rule with its attendant evils, hatred and injustice be checked. We've seen the two causes of the revolution, the religious issue and the invasion of localism and of self-government, and the implications of these positions for us today. Let us now examine some other aspects of American history which clearly distinguish the American system then from what it is today. Important among these was the attitude towards property and suffrage. The question of a federal requirement of property for suffrage was earnestly raised at the convention by several men. Governor Morris objected to the rule of numbers alone as against property, stating, quote, Not liberty. Property is the main object of society. End quote. Rutledge agreed, quote, Property is certainly the principal object of society. End quote. King said, quote, Property is the primary object of society and in fixing a ratio ought not to be excluded from the estimates. End quote. Butler held that, quote, Property is the only just measure of representation. James Wilson clearly disagreed. Quote, property is not the sole nor the primary end of government and society. The improvement of the human mind is the most noble object. End quote. Madison held that such a federal measure would establish class hostility in the United States while evading the fact that, quote, landed possessions were no certain evidence of real wealth, end quote, many landowners being deeply in debt. Benjamin Franklin pointed out several objections to the property qualification, warning, quote, Remember, the scripture requires in rulers that they should be men hating covetousness, end quote, Dickinson opposed the qualification since a constitutional statement would not be complete and yet would limit Congress, quote, from supplying the omissions, end quote. Moreover, quote, 
The best defense lay in the freeholders who were to elect the legislature. While this source should remain pure, the public interest would be safe. If it ever should be corrupt, no little expedience would repel the danger. End quote. A federal requirement of property was thus defeated, and the matter left in the hands of the states and counties. Madison was not certain exactly what the answer to the problem of qualified suffrage was, but he felt that, quote, the freeholders of the country would be the safest depositories of Republican liberty, end quote. He foresaw the time when, unlike the situation in his day, many voters would be propertyless working men who would become, quote, the tools of opulence and ambition, end quote. The result would be a European-style aristocracy. Governor Morris feared the same thing, quote, Unless you establish a qualification of property, we shall have an aristocracy, end quote. The demand for a property qualification was thus as a preventative to aristocracy or oligarchy, the plunder of the people by the rich few in the name of the masses. Much later, a master politician stated what was necessary for the triumph of an oligarchy. Franklin Delano Roosevelt declared, quote, now, to bring about government by oligarchy masquerading as democracy, it's fundamentally essential that practically all authority and control be centralised in our national government. End quote. Property qualifications of varying degrees existed on the state level. They tended to be even more strict on the local and county level where the property tax was involved. To give voting rights over property to non property men was seen as destructive of law and order. Since, Cooper stated, quote, The governments of towns and villages, for instance, are almost entirely directed to the regulation of property and to the control of local interests, end quote. Suffrage should be restricted to the propertied who have a stake in the issues involved. In some areas today, separate ballots exist for property owners who alone can vote on bond issues and like measures. The mainspring of many conservative movements of the 1950s and 1960s is a revolt of property owners against equalitarian and confiscatory measures. The issue with respect to property was perhaps most sharply stated in 1843 by Karl Marx. It should be noted that his references to, quote-unquote, the state, mean thereby except in reference to American states, the modern, secular state, quote, the state is the intermediary between man and his freedom, as Christ is the intermediary whom the Christian burdens with his divinity and all his religious ties, so the state is the intermediary whom man burdens with his entire non-divinity and his complete absence of ties. The political triumph of man over religion shares all the advantages and disadvantages of political triumph generally. Thus, for example, the state annuls private property, Man proclaims politically that private property is abolished as soon as he abolishes the property qualification for the vote, as has been done in several American states. Is not private property as an idea abolished when the non-owner becomes legislator for the owner? The property qualification for the vote is the ultimate political form of a recognition of private property. End quote. Some points of very great importance are here asserted or implied. First, as the state grows in its power, it, quote, emancipates itself from religion, end quote, and professes, quote, no religion except its own statehood, end quote. This secular state accordingly becomes man's, quote, unquote, intermediary or mediator and man's saviour. The state becomes the road to paradise regained and the source of man's salvation. The secular state is thus inevitably a messianic order. Second, quote, the state annuls private property, end quote. Quote, the state can be a free state without the man in it being a free man, end quote. It is certainly significant that in the United States today there is increasing reference to our status as a, quote, free nation, end quote, and less to our heritage as a free people, free individuals. For the state to be free requires us to ask, free from whom? 
The state wants to be free, not only from foreign powers, but also, most commonly of all, from bondage to its own people. To free itself, the state must enslave its citizens. To do this, it must first secularize itself and the people, and second, annul private property, since both Christianity and property make the citizenry largely independent of the state and keep the state strictly limited. Third, Marx pointed out, quote, Private property as an idea, end quote, is, quote, abolished when the non-owner becomes legislator for the owner, end quote. How long would Christianity last as an institution if unbelievers could vote in churches? Will non-owners respect property to any greater degree? The answer is the steady confiscation of wealth, property and income through taxation. As of June 1963, federal, state and local civilian workers exceeded 12 million, with another 28 million receiving welfare in one form or another. Federal executive civilian employees numbered 2,353,054, legislative 22,853, judicial 4,900 for a total of 2,380,807. The total revenue of federal, state and local civil government exceeded $150 billion a year. Since one in seven persons is a welfare beneficiary, the burden of this taxation falls heavily on the responsible citizenry. The rise of statism coincides with the decline of faith, of private property and of responsibility. And despite its rise to power, the state must further erode these things and is hence by nature hostile to them. In no other area has so radical a change taken place from the early years of the United States as in education. The, quote, public school, end quote, movement or status education did not exist until the 1830s. Status education began as a subversive movement and the story of its bitter savage struggle has not yet been written. The essentials of the drive which produced statist education are clearly seen in Horace Mann, 1796 to 1859, quote, the father of the common schools, end quote. First and foremost, Mann was a Unitarian. New England Unitarianism was in the forefront of the battle for statist education. For Mann, Unitarianism was true Christianity and with humorless zeal he fought for his holy faith. The direction of Unitarian thought had been very early charted by William Ellery Channing. According to Phillips, for Channing, quote, The secular organisation of society usually takes the place of divine society on earth, historically the Christian church, and itself becomes the agent of God's salvation. End quote. Channing moved towards, quote, the divinization of the national state, end quote, stating in 1812, quote, that government is a divine institution, end quote. The biblical position is that civil government is divinely ordained or instituted, but definitely not in itself divine. Indeed, biblical faith is at war with such a position. But Channing, by 1830, held to, quote, a completely univocal community with all human and divine sanctions, End quote. For Channing, according to Phillips, quote, Man's salvation, then, is to be worked out not on the basis of membership in the mystical body of Christ, but citizenship in the glorious race of mankind. End quote. For Theodore Parker, another Unitarian leader, the true church was the great invisible church of mankind to be revealed through America. O.B. Frothingham, subsequently, 1872, affirmed, quote, the religion of humanity, end quote, and his hopes in, quote, the new paradise, end quote, to be brought in by the state. In view of this very extensive Unitarian movement, it is not surprising that its members and friends saw the old Christian school as backward and incapable of dealing with the basic issues of the times. True education had to be concerned with liberty, and the order of man's liberty was the state, as Horace Mann fervently affirmed. The responsibility of the church was libertarian rather than salvationist, and freedom was institutional, that is, statist in nature. 
As a result, education was properly the province of the state. Man laboured, therefore, to free the schools from their basically Christian and independent nature in order to give them true direction, as he saw it, in terms of the state. His hostility against the Calvinism and against the free schools of the day was thus bitter and intense. Education, to fulfil its calling, had to be statist. State schools would, he believed, render most sin, crime, poverty, ignorance and prisons obsolete in a century. Second, Horace Mann was not, in the modern sense, a socialist, but he did hold to the premises of that position. According to Merle Curty, Mann had naive misconceptions about socialism. While it would be an error to apply the full modern sense of the word socialist to man, it is clear that his answers to social problems were basically statist. While in terms of current practice man was in many things quote-unquote conservative, he was, by his acceptance of the state as the univocal order of man, radically committed to a socialised order of which the school was the first and foundational part. Moreover, the conversion of America's educational system into an instrument of statism was the most important step into socialism which a society can ever take, for to socialise the child is a far more radical step than to socialise income, monetary wealth or property. It was therefore precisely what the Beards termed it, quote, the educational revolution, end quote, that manifested Unitarianism, on the whole, prided itself on its socialism. Prominent Unitarians were instrumental in the many socialistic enthusiasms of the 1840s, and Brook Farm, according to Noyes, quote, In its original conception was not a Fourier formation at all, but an American seedling. It was the child of New England Unitarianism, end quote. State-controlled education was one of a number of causes Unitarianism championed, Temperance, peace and abolition, among other causes, also inflamed these humourless reformers. Their answer to all these problems and many more was statist action. Behind John Brown, who was subsidised to start warfare, stood his sponsors, the Secret Six, all of whom were Unitarians. John Brown's hanging was compared to Jesus' crucifixion by Thoreau and Edouard de Sturkel, the Russian minister, wrote to his government that Brown was being, quote, proclaimed as the equal of our saviour, end quote. This was the Unitarian ethos in which Horace Mann moved. Some Unitarians gave themselves over to fighting for peace, others for abolition, feminism and the like. Mann's status panacea was government control of schools, it should be added that, as a dedicated advocate of phrenology, he was already committed to the faith that a man's life was essentially governed by external factors, a first principle of statist salvation. The concept of quote-unquote democratic or statist education has waged war, not only against the Christian faith, but against the family as well. Very early, in the 1860s, California made criticism of a teacher by a, quote, parent, guardian or other person in the presence or hearing of a pupil thereof, a misdemeanor, end quote. Other states had also elevated the authority of the teacher above that of parents. After World War II, James Bryan Conant wrote, quote, Wherever the institution of the family is still a powerful force, as it is in this country, Surely, inequality of opportunity is automatically and often unconsciously a basic principle of the nation. The more favoured parents endeavoured to obtain even greater favours for their children. Therefore, when we Americans proclaim an adherence to the doctrine of equality of opportunity, we face the necessity for a perpetual compromise. Now, it seems to me important to recognise both the inevitable conflict and the continuing nature of the compromise. End quote. The public, or statist schools, which began their history as a subversive movement aimed at subverting the old order, now cast the implication of subversion on the family. It should be remembered that the family was once the primary educational institution. As late as 1883, a parental guidebook faced with the spread of state schools urged, quote, 
Parents will do wisely wherever it's possible to carry on the work of elementary instruction at home, end quote. In the 1950s, when highly qualified parents did this and did it ably, they were hauled into courts. Statist education is increasingly intolerant of any rivalry. But in recent years, a steady revolt against statist education has been developing, with as many as 16% of all grade and high school students enrolled in non-state schools by 1960. This has been the one area where the advance of statism has been turned into a retreat. The threat, however, of a major offensive is very real. State, federal and United Nations agencies seek control over every kind of school, statist and non-statist, in the name of quote-unquote humanity. The necessary implication is too seldom faced by Americans the need to attack by advocating the outright abolition of all status schools as inimical to liberty. Unfortunately, the only county so to move, Prince Edward County, Virginia, did so in 1958 for a reason other than the issue of statism. That is, the US Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals order for desegregation of the county's high schools. There is reason to believe, however, that the heyday of the quote-unquote public school is ended, and that free schools will eventually supplant it, although not without struggle. But it needs to be remembered that statist and secular education was not a part of the American system for the first two centuries of its history, including its first 40 years under the Constitution, and even then was viewed for some time as a radical and dangerous innovation. Another vastly different aspect of the current scene, reflecting the change in the American system, concerns welfare. An adequate history of welfare does not exist. The major role of the medieval church, and especially of various orders, in ministering to the sick and needy is too little known. Extensive foundations and trust funds for these purposes were confiscated by the national states, and the quote-unquote modern era began with major problems in the realm of charity as a result. Gradually, churches, private associations, trusts and foundations assumed the responsibility and met it. The activity of the civil government in this area was almost entirely limited to the county and was limited in its jurisdiction. The transition from the older to the current situation can best be analysed by briefly examining Kansas City in 1909. In the autumn, when thousands were unemployed, the Helping Hand Institute set up rock quarrying and breaking operations with the rock sold to the city for roadwork. The help thus provided was insufficient to meet the emergency. Wealthy citizens, led by William Volker, worked to create the first municipal department of public welfare, April 4, 1910. This public agency, however, was supported by private funds, Volker funds, so that it was still, as in the past, a case of organised private charity meeting all needs and resolving problems. This department set up a loan agency for the needy, confronted the problems of prostitution and immorality and sought to coordinate the work of private agencies such as the Helping Hand Institute and the Provident Association to meet needs not covered by existing private agencies. After Volker left the department in April 1911, it became in fact a municipal agency and politicians like Thomas J. Pendergast recognised its potentiality as an instrument of political power. Volker himself, quote, learned that government and politics are inseparable by definition, that political charity is not charity at all, end quote. He observed in 1918, when the last member of the independent board, Leroy Halbert, was ousted by, quote, the machine-dominated city council, end quote, quote, I've learned something about government. Government must be restricted to those activities which can be entrusted to the worst citizens, not the best, end quote. Other cities very rapidly followed Kansas City in establishing departments of public welfare. States and then the federal government quickly followed suit. The tremendous potentialities for political power were widely recognised. Not charity, but power is the primary function of statist welfare. The attempts of various agencies in recent years to move faster than the public demand and then to create by propaganda that public demand is motivated by a lust for power not by a regard for human welfare. 
Charity is a byproduct. There must be enough, like bread and circuses, to keep the masses happy. But the foremost goal is power. Power to be gods and to manipulate men in society, to indulge the whims of megalomania in the name of benevolence. And with this goes a rewriting of history. It is not surprising that some college students are beginning to report, unfortunately with credulity, that they are taught that, after the 1929 economic depression, hungry mobs went rampaging in the streets and people dropped to the sidewalks of America in the last stages of hunger. It's clear-cut that a second American revolution has taken place. In the words of Garrett Garrett's title, the revolution was and it is now trying to extirpate the citizen's memory of the first revolution. This second revolution is a kind of return to Europe, to, quote, the house of bondage, end quote, a rebellion against liberty and its responsibilities. It's not surprising that it has gone hand in hand with either a debunking of or an ignorance concerning the American Revolution and its background. For the restoration of that first revolution and its extension, there must first be returned to a Christian faith, a faith that not the state but Christ is the saviour and mediator, and, second, a return to the Protestant restoration of feudalism, to the centrality and importance of the local unit, the county and its elements.